Well, good morning and welcome to the second annual Jack Kogan Integrative Medicine Grand Rounds, Grand Rounds Lecture. My name is Peter Wayne and I have the privilege of serving as a director for the Osher Center, which is jointly based at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. This named lecture honors the memory and the remarkable life of Jack Kogan and is generally supported um, by a gift from Mrs. Mary Corneal, Jack's wife, in appreciation of the supportive integrative care that Jack received at the Osher Clinical Center. I'm so delighted that Mary is able to join us here today um, in person for this celebration. <laughs> Yesterday evening, Mary, um, our guest speaker, David Rakel, and a few of Jack's former, provider, former providers um, shared a wonderful meal together while we enjoyed listening to stories of Jack's remarkable life. So Jack lived a long, remarkable, and highly accomplished professional life, which included being a former chairman and managing partner at a prestigious law firm, while also helping run a very successful investment company at the same time. He was also on the boards of many civic and charitable organizations in the Boston area and internationally. Yet despite his remarkably busy life, Jack understood the importance of exercise for maintaining a healthy body and mind which was most evident in his lifelong passion for running, which spans back to his membership on his high school cross-country team. I had the privilege of meeting Jack a few years before his 90th birthday and introduced him to Tai Chi personally to support his balance and ability to continue to run, despite challenges he was facing, facing associated with advancing Parkinson's disease. Right from our first session, I was so deeply touched by Jack's enthusiasm for life and his humble and often childlike zeal for improving his balance and mobility. Um, I left our sessions feeling like I learned and got a lot more from Jack than he got from me. Jack made a lot of progress with Tai Chi. Jane Moss, um, who took over as Jack's primary Tai Chi trainer, shared with me an encounter she recalled at dinner last night. Jack arrived in one class um, really eager to show her how Tai Chi principles um, helped him mobilize a temporarily, temporarily frozen step and how another Tai Chi skill helped him navigate around a corner, which is challenging for people with Parkinson's disease. But typically, after these serious conversations, they shifted to talking about how his movements were a lot like Fred Astaire. So, <laughs> that, um, Arthur Medor, a neuromuscular and Feldenkrais-based uh, um, movement uh, therapist at the Osher Center, also worked closely with Jack for many years, helping him sustain his flexibility, balance, and coordination. Arthur himself, a runner and lover of exercise, shared a memory he had of Jack uh, when they both visited a, a special gyroscopic treadmill, which allows people to, to run um, without their full um, weight and sort of modify the gravitational field. At this session, Jack clocked, and this is in his 90s, um, Jack clocked an 11-minute mile pace for a chunk of the training period. At the end, as was common following many of their sessions to get together, Jack was as excited as a little child and couldn't wait to tell Mary about his, his successes. Um, Arthur added um, personally in a note to me, I think that his positive outlook and these little triumphs, along with his love for Mary, helped him thrive despite his challenges of his Parkinson's disease. So I believe this zeal and zest for life, which unfortunately cannot be distilled into a pill or bottled, is at the heart of the science of salutogenesis, the study of what supports health and resilience, which is the topic for today's lecture, which I can't think of a better presenter than Dr. Rakel for, for bringing this information to us. But before I'm introducing, um, I meant to share this beautiful picture of um, Jack and Mary. But before introducing our speaker for today, I have a few practical announcements. Um, if you're uh, attending today's um, meeting, especially virtually, and haven't signed in here, or if you didn't sign in here, and you wish to obtain uh, continuing medical education credits, um, please e email Ms. Emma Owings at this address, and she'll oversee the process. And then second, um, at the end of David's uh, presentation today, we're going to have an open question and answer session. If anyone who's listening to this uh, presentation virtually would like to uh, present a question that emerges during his talk, please do so by emailing um, uh, at this address. Okay. Um, 
and we'll be curating these questions and then we'll present them to David at the end. So now it's my sincere pleasure and honor to introduce uh, my colleague and a growing friend, uh, Dr. David Rakel. Uh, Dr. Rakel is a professor and chair of the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the University of Wisconsin. During his time at University of Wisconsin-Madison, he founded the Integrative Medicine Program, now known as the Integrative Health Program, and received the Gold Foundation's Leonard Tao Humanism in Medicine Award, the school's highest honor for excellence in compassion and care. His team worked with more than 50 clinical systems within the VA's health administration system to uh, implement changes to make care more personalized, proactive, and patient-driven. Dr. Rakel is author of both academic and popular writings, and he has a gift for communicating medical information in a way that's accessible to people of all different backgrounds. He's published 11 books, including the textbook of family medicine, current therapy, and integrative medicine, which is now in its fifth edition, which is essentially a Bible for all of us in the field of integrative medicine. He also published numerous peer-reviewed studies on topics such as mindfulness and meditation and the power of the therapeutic encounter. He serves as editor-in-chief of Practice Update, a website devoted to, commun to commentaries on primary medical care research. Like Mr. Kogan, um, Dave, as I'll call him, um, has an in innate zeal for life which shapes not only his own path, but also inspires his patients, colleagues, and students. So without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rakel. And as you see, I'm going to raise the podium for... <laughs> uh, it, it's such a, a pleasure and an honor to be here with you all. Thank you uh, for inviting me and to be a part of this and uh, to uh, remember Jack, who I learned a little bit about last night uh, at dinner. So um, uh, I'd, I'd like to start off with um, just recognition of the twinkle in his eye, if you will. As, as Peter just said, you know, that zeal, that, that curiosity, that always asking for things to learn from about the complexity of life. I, I, like, to, I like props. I brought some props. And, and uh, one prop I like is, is a string. And how does this string connect us to other humans, connect us to new knowledge, connecting us to believe in different ways that have been conditioned into our mind? And I think, Jack, and tell me if I'm wrong, Mary, but he was good at uh, loose knots. Our mind wants loose knots, right? Because woo, we, we learn this in medicine all the time. What we learned five years ago is usually going to be different five years from now. So we need loose knots so we can easily unravel them and believe in new ways and explore and experience and grow and enhance our cognitive diversity and be inviting to filling our gaps of, of lack of awareness so we can get smarter. And that's what I love about education. So the, the first pearl is you don't want tight, your brain to be made of tight knots, <laughs> right? Because, oh, what have I done? Oh, you know, I can't get this undone. Would you say, Mary, that Jack had a bunch of loose knots in a good way? <laughs> in a good way that allowed him to create connections to meaning in our lives. And that's that sparkle, we can't teach that. So how uh, can we encourage that while also using the lessons of science to help us figure out how we can uh, live a long and joyful life? Uh, <laughs> I'm grateful for Peter's invitation to come here. We've been working together for a long time. And this was in Miami. And, and we were trying to increase the awareness of the importance of Height diversity. <laughs> and so I am very grateful for Peter and the whole Osher team, uh, and also to Bernard Osher, who we just celebrated his 95th birthday uh, in Seattle, who has also been very generous in supporting this work. Uh, because health and healing doesn't have as much of a uh, funds flow. <laughs> when, when you help complex systems heal, 
There's not a lot of reimbursement for that yet, but we're going to figure that out. We need to figure out how to make that good medicine that I can make a living doing, that you can make a living doing, that helps us define interprofessional teams that are needed most for a community. We're going to explore that today. These are my uh, disclosures. I do a lot of medical publishing. I figure education is a good thing to create implicit bias for. I don't support any products or accept any money for any products other than educational texts. So I edit a lot of these things. This last one is a, a, a book on the research of the power of the therapeutic connection between humans. Uh, all proceeds are donated towards salutogenic science education. Is there any truth in this? Remember the 20 extra years you added to your life through clean, healthy living? Well, these are them. <laughs> now, uh, ideally, we want to really shorten the time between our health span and our lifespan. We do not want to spend 20, 30 years with chronic debilitating diseases. Sometimes we have to. But if we had a choice, we'd want to reduce that time of suffering and prolong our life. As Peter said last night, we want to add life to our years and add years to our life. Hopefully, first, we want to add life to our years. I think that's what Jack was a good example of. How do we add life to those years? Uh, a good recent example of, of this, I think, was uh, Queen Elizabeth. This is a photo of her two days before her death, <laughs> where she was welcoming the new prime minister who didn't have as much resiliency. I didn't think she lasted long. But look, this is how I want to be two days before I die. It's all going to it's going to happen to all of us. But how can we use that as our goal and figure out how to create a pseudogenic system that facilitates these outcomes? How do we pay for what we want for our communities? We're not doing it yet. And that brings us into um, the importance of synergy. Very rarely is there just one magic pill. Sometimes there is, I'm grateful for that. But rarely do we have one magic thing. This is a study done uh, comparing Life Simple 7. I don't think they're simple. This is from the American Heart Association where they took a large group of people and they looked at their genetic risks for the number one killer on the planet, heart disease. They looked at six million little SNPs that increase your risk of a heart attack. That's the genetics or nature. And then they looked at nurture. What are some things that we can do that might epigenetically suppress that gene? That even though I have the highest risk for heart disease, could I do these things that actually kept that from expressing itself? Yes. Those people at the highest genetic risk who did these seven things, no smoking, optimal weight, nutrition, movement, blood pressure, lipids, blood sugar, those are more biometrics, those last three, but they're influenced by lifestyle. But those who did the best in this with the highest risk for genetics added 20 years to their life. Wow. <laughs> that is pretty impressive. Now, we know the science behind this. It's uncontroversial, but we, hard to do. Hard to do. So we're going to talk about what might motivate us to, to do this. And that's the meaning and the leverage and the why. What's the why that will encourage us to emote behavior, movement, ex exercise movement, emotion? What's the emotion that will connect, connect us to negating whatever risk we might have? So uh, I'm a little cynical on our UL healthcare system. $4.2 trillion, the most of any country in the world by far, about twice as much, and it doesn't produce health. Some would argue that's not a system, and it's certainly not healthy. But why is our investment so poor? I would argue that uh, this is a, the healthcare spending, and then this is the performance of the health system. Compared to all the other industrialized countries, we don't do that well. Why do you think that is? I would argue, uh, when we make money taking care of disease, what does it want us to have more of? Disease. 
We used to pay firefighters by how many fires they put out. We did. We were actually the last country to stop doing that. Why is that not a good idea? <laughs> we don't want more fires for our communities, right? We still pay health care that way. It's not very intelligent. But that is, we get what we pay for, right? And we are now starting to shift, CMS is leading this, to start to say, hey, we want to pay you for keeping people out of the hospital, for doing these things that Jack resonated with. How do we do that? And how do we do it for the most vulnerable, underserved populations? If you have a population of 1,000 people and you're going to invest in one group, you're going to get the biggest return on investment investing in those who are most vulnerable, social determinants of health those who did not have the privileges that we had, that I had. I can only speak for myself. What an opportunity to give back. So let's uh, look at a few more statistics. 35.6% of Americans over 60 are on five drugs or more. That's the diagnosis of polypharmacy. Now, I want to be clear, some people really need those medications. <laughs> so this isn't a judgment. This isn't a bad thing. But what should our first priority be? Our first priority should be be on the fewest, most effective medications and focus on prevention of the disease. That's not our focus, but it can be. It can be. <laughs> In the NHANES trial, a big, a big study looked at uh, people who were treated for hypertension, and they found out that 18.5% were on a drug that caused hypertension. We get so easy of slapping a pill on every ill that we then get into the risk of harm of all these manipulations of nature that we see. Now, thank God for the manipulations of nature. If you've had a heart attack, being on a statin reduces your risk of another heart attack by 30%. You need to be on a statin. Blood pressure medicines, great, really important. But instead of starting the blood pressure medicine, maybe we should look at lifestyle and other things like movement and exercise first. So uh, this is one of the things I see that just drives me nuts, <laughs> is that someone comes in with mild cognitive impairment, and we put them on acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, acetylcholine like Aricept, a drug for Alzheimer's disease. And how does that work? It enhances acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is the memory hormone. I can't tell you how many times I've seen patients on drugs for their memory loss while they're on drugs that cause anticholinergic side effects. So an anticholinergic side effect means it reduces acetylcholine. Why would we put someone on, on a drug to increase acetylcholine when we also have them on a drug that reduces acetylcholine? So we have to realize that antispasmodics, muscle relaxants, tricyclics, first generation, and histamines like Benadryl. You know, these things actually can worsen memory the longer we're on them. And this study increased the risk, showed that the people on the highest doses of this class of medication can increase the risk of dementia by 54%. How do we reduce this before we put them on the drug? And I wish we had a good drug for dementia. I wish we did. We don't yet. We, I hope we will in the future, but if the potential therapeutic benefit for dementia was 70 points, the medications work about two to three points. But what do we all want? We want the magic. <laughs> we, want, we want the silver bullet. And, uh, and it's not generally that easy. There are very few sinner silver bullets. Um, but what we want to talk about is silver buckshot. Right? How can we use multiple things synergistically to have the greatest effect? And that's what the science is teaching us is most important. It's not just about taking one thing or doing one thing. It's about synergy of multiple things. So which brings us to salutogenic science. Salute, health, genesis, the origins of. That's simple. Salute. Salute to your health. Pathogenesis, pathos, to suffer, genesis, the origins of. 95% of what's taught here in your medical school is disease-focused. 
which is great, it's fine. <laughs> We've gotten really good at treating disease. But if that's all we invest in, we just sit back and wait for things to break, and then we try and use our technology to reverse it. And so many chronic diseases now are irreversible. Particularly if we make access to good primary care. I saw your primary care clinic just down the road. If that's more difficult to access, access we then rely on the acute and catastrophic rescue therapy, which is really expensive, really expensive and not very effective. So how do we create a salutogenic science? You have to look at the complexity of authenticity. <laughs> you have to look at the root of what gives that tree the nutrition it needs to self-heal. And that's a science we haven't given our attention to, but we need to. If we're just focusing on the branch of the tree, great, but it's myopic, it's limited, it's nearsighted. This term came from uh, um, Dr. Antonovsky, Aaron Antonovsky. He was a social, uh, social scientist, American-Israeli social scientist, who studied uh, survivors of Jewish concentration camps. And he saw some people, he mainly studied women, some women who went through that most horrifying thing known to humans, probably on the history of our planet, who actually came out the other end uh, with their health. And he, and he wanted to say, OK, what influenced this person to be healthy through this terrible environment that they had to go through? And uh, he developed the science of coherence. And his, his quote was, my fundamental philosophy uh, philosophical assumption is that the river is a stream of life. There are forks in the river that lead to gentle streams or to dangerous rapids and whirlpools. But his philosophical main academic question is, what shapes one's ability to swim well? Let's let that be our science. And how do we expand that to our communities? And let's pay for that. <laughs> Now, is that as easy as prescribing a pill? No, it's complicated. It takes time. We've got to get to know people. And, uh, you know, but that's fun. That's the most joyful thing I do in my work, is to get to know humans. You go into the context of their lives, and you take your glasses of conditioning off. You go into their seat, <laughs> and you see how they see the world. And only then, after you experience their world, their context, do you then put your glasses on, your expertise in service of their best outcome. So often, we just project our science to get on to the next patient. I just shut off their acid pump without listening to what's eating them up inside. And that's a bad process. It's effective. My, the business of medicine in America supports it. But it's not the outcome uh, that we want. So I would argue that we're all ecologists. Everybody who wants to learn about health should be an ecologist. I learned that Peter was an evolutionary ecologist. Uh, um, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and because I bet you loved the complexity of nature, of authenticity, that um, if we're just going to study the disease or the leaf on the plant, we start with a tree, and, and we don't have sight of the forest. I would argue if we're going to really be good diagnosticians, if we're really going to make the authentic diagnosis, we need breadth before we go narrow. We have to understand the tree and the forest it lives in. We have to understand that relationship, because health requires us to look at the non-physical, the biopsychosocial, spiritual, communal aspects of being human. And that's different for everybody in this room. And then we use our scientific guidelines to give the best treatment possible. But that is after we first listen. Sir William Osler said, uh, health care is an art based in science. An art based in science. What's the art of this human relationship? So when we start wide, we can also go deeper. Because when we see. Uh, I love to listen to metaphor. And um, a, a patient came in with proctalgia fugax. This is my favorite story of metaphor. Proctalgia fugax is painful rectal spasms. We usually treat it with a muscle relaxer or topical nitroglycerin. 
Uh, but I had a little bit more time. I was a resident, and, and I asked, well, huh, what's going on in your life? And she said, Dave, my boss is a pain in the ass. <laughs> and I said, huh, you're having painful rectal spasms, and your boss is a pain in the ass. And she said, huh. And we went there. We turned towards suffering. We dealt with that. And guess what happened to her rectal It doesn't always happen that way but it makes for a good story. And this was a true story, but it doesn't always happen that way. But we have to listen to the human. We have to listen to the story because a symptom is our body asking for some sort of change. And if we're just too quick to suppress it with our technology, we miss the teacher. We miss to learn from what is going on here so it influences our willingness to want to be different. So this is network science, and this really excites me that we're using all this big data to understand how things are interrelated. This middle graphic is all the technology that happens after you place one Facebook post. Look at all that intelligence that happens when you place one Facebook post. What's the main intention of that? To sell you stuff. <laughs> What if we use this to serve your best outcome? We have the technology, but what's driving what we do is usually finances, which isn't a bad thing. But what if we use this financially to drive health outcomes? Pathogenesis is very linear. Here, this is how you do it, take this pill. Salutogenesis is nonlinear we go into the context of human lives and we find a pattern that's unique to you. It takes time. <laughs> it takes time. That's why I love primary care, because I have ongoing relationships over time, and that helps me develop insight into the salutogenic context of humans, that biopsychosocial spiritual influence. So I thought we would focus on how do we maintain that cognitive function, because maybe it's because I... I'm getting older, <laughs> I want to do that. Uh, but this is something that we all, I would argue, maybe I'm projecting, uh, are interested in. How do, we, how do we retain this? So let's explore this. Let's talk a little bit about nutrition, first of all. This was the Three City Bordeaux study in France. And they used network science, all these data points, to interconnect all these different nutritional habits. And then they followed people's incidence of dementia over time and they wanted to see which foods were most associated with dementia. Alcohol, red and processed meats, sugar, and bread were the big winners. And, um, and this would always be a little careful if this was an isolated study, but this has been reproduced uh, in other studies. One of the more recent ones was this study, uh, just published a couple months ago, in, in neurology, where they looked at the amount of processed foods people eat and the incidence of dementia. The more processed food you eat, the higher risk of dementia. But if you replace 10% of your processed foods with good, healthy, whole foods, 20% reduction, 20% replacement of processed foods with healthy, whole foods, 34% reduction. Not a bad investment. My wife and I pay for a CSA at home, community-supported agriculture. We get this big thing of groceries. The challenge is, how do we cook it? <laughs> so we look at recipes and we try and figure it out, right? It costs more money than McDonald's. How do we make good food subsidized? We should be subsidizing broccoli and blueberries and not just corn, which we figured out how to make into fuel and sugar. How do we subsidize the foods that we want people to eat most so that becomes most affordable for our most vulnerable populations? Alcohol. Uh, the UK Biobank study has the most MRIs of any population on the planet. The UK Biobank study has followed, I think, 72,000 Brits over time and imaged their brains. And uh, I like to have a beer. When I get home at night, this study tells me just one. <laughs> because after two units of alcohol and a pint 
like a pint of Guinness in a pub in, in England, that's two units. Okay? Anything above that, that's, that would go over two glasses of wine or more than a pint shrinks the brain. Is a, sorry, is associated with brain shrinkage. We can't say cause and effect, but it was associated with less brain tissue. So even if I want a second beer, I don't go there. This, this study influences uh, my behavior. So um, this is the easiest slide I've used. I print this in my exam room for my patients. And I used to have all the studies to support this slide, but there wasn't enough room for the picture. Just take my word for it. <laughs> and you have Walter Willett here. You have other pillars of nutrition research here. I would argue that they would agree with this slide. We should get most of our nutrition from roots, plants, then fins. Pesco vegetarians are probably the healthiest uh, on the, have shown, probably the healthiest diet on the planet. Roots and fins. Then two legs, then four legs, and then packaged meats. Why is packaged meat so bad? Uh, I'm going to argue that anytime we try and manipulate nutrition or manipulate nature, history has taught us that we have failed miserably each time. Partially hydrogenated trans fats. We created those to allow Twinkies to live on the shelf for 30 years, right? We thought that we were doing a good thing by using more vegetable oils to create more longevity of our food. How about high fructose corn syrup? What has that done to pediatric obesity levels? How about packaged meats? Now, they're not bad until we start doing stuff to them. We inject processed meats with nitrous amines. Now, nitrates are good. They lower our blood pressure. When you come in, I hope you never do, but if you came in with angina from a heart disease, we, in the olden days, we'd give you an inch of nitro paste, and that would dilate your arteries and help your angina go away. Nitrates are really healthy. But when we combine the nitrate with an amine, it becomes oncogenic. And we inject our meat with nitrous amines, not only as a preservative, but also to dilate the blood vessels in the meat so your sausage looks pink instead of pale like our medical school cadaver. Not very appetizing. <laughs> So it's what we do to the meat that has the biggest influence on health outcomes. We know this is a big risk factor for colon cancer. Processed meats. Uh, nitrous amines is, are oncogenic. So try and stay away from that. Once in a while is fine. You know, don't make your host who has the, what's it called, the charcuterie? Charcuterie, thank you. <laughs> I can never say that word. You know, you don't need to insult your host when they bring out the charcuterie tray. Uh, but don't, don't eat the whole thing. <laughs> Might not be great for you. Homocysteine is a test I've been ordering more of. It's 25 bucks in my healthcare system. It's not that expensive. But homocysteine is a measure of how well we methylate proteins. And for the body to make a protein, it requires methylation. To turn off and on genes, it requires methylation. So that study where we showed genetic risk and the simple lifestyle seven, it's methylation that turns off that risk gene. So we really want the body to be efficient at methylating. The byproduct of poor methylation is homocysteine. So we really want to keep homocysteine low as much as possible. There's some cofactors that help with converting homocysteine into methionine. And those are B vitamins, B6, B12, folic acid, and SAMe, acetylmethionine, uh, which also is good for depression and anxiety. But how do we need less of these supplements? <laughs> you eat more of these foods, right? Folate, foliage. You get folate from foliage. Green things, pretty simple. Nuts, a handful, not a canful, we like to say. A handful of nuts reduces all-cause risk of death by 20%. I have them each day at my lunch. Fish, berries, beans, and olive oil, those are all really good methylators. So if your, meth if your homocysteine is a little high and you're not eating these foods, first eat these foods. A pretty simple second is supplement with those B vitamins. And how do we make sure we're absorbing those B vitamins? 
We'll talk about some of the risks of malabsorption here in a bit. So homocysteine, I think, is a good thing to check. It's something I'm checking on my patients on a fairly regular basis, particularly after we get uh, to a certain age. But if they're really high and they're eating really good, then we check for this genetic mutation, MTHFR mutation, that some people have, a very small amount of people, that makes it so we then need to give methylated forms that already cross the blood-brain barrier. So just like the, we have this leaky gut barrier, which we want to keep healthy, we also have a brain barrier that we want to keep healthy. And we don't want that to get leaky. <laughs> and, and, and so um, when we give these supplements in already the activated form, they're, they're much more likely to get into the blood-brain barrier and do their goodness. Uh, this has also been found to be elevated in people with resistant depression. So if I have someone on de who's depressed and they're just not responding to anything, I'll check a homocysteine. If they're really high, we'll give them this. Because there's been good research showing that serotonin reuptake inhibitors and folate together enhances effectiveness. So something to, to remember. All right. Remember, nature knows more than we do. I think it was Marion Nestle who said, I choose to eat butter because I trust cows more than biochemists. <laughs> I like biochemists, too. Uh, thank God for biochemists. Uh, they have made our life a lot better. Um, but every time we've tried to manipulate nature, it, like I said, it, it's turned around and, and bit us in the behind. And um, I think the next example of this will be non-nutritive sweeteners. Non-nutritive sweeteners Aspartame or equal, saccharin, sweet and low, sucralose, Splenda. And then there's this new one called Avantane that's 20,000 times sweeter than sugar. Now, if I give you no calorie water and no calorie Diet Coke, which one will cause you more weight gain? Well, what about the calorie hypothesis, right? They both have no calories. Why would the no calorie Diet Coke Sorry, diet soda, I better use that term. Why, why would that cause more weight gain? Huh, we're not quite sure, but we think it's because our cells have a sweetness receptor on them. Even if there's no calories, they sense sweetness. And if they sense sweetness, it stimulates insulin release, which creates this whole metabolic dysfunction. The more insulin, then my blood sugars go down. The worst thing to do is to put these non-nutritive sweeteners in sports drinks, because they actually may lower your blood sugar. And you need sugar when you're exercising. So these non-nutritive sweeteners are being put in all of our foods now, because now they're cheaper. They're cheaper than just regular sugar. Now, if you drink a lot of soda each day, this is a study looking at the risk of stroke and dementia in those who drank more sodas a day versus less. More than one a day, look at the stroke-free survival rate. Goes way down. Now, why is this? Probably multifactorial. Number one, cans are lined with bisphenol A. Anything shiny, like those receipts you get out of those copiers, packed full of bisphenol A. Bisphenol A will raise your blood pressure also toxic to the brain in high levels. But we've used it in our products, and anytime we drink stuff out of cans, industry will figure this out, and they'll start to say bisphenol A free cans, but they're not there yet. So not only is it bisphenol, bisphenol A, this non-nutritive sweetener gets metabolized, aspartame particularly, into formaldehyde, and formaldehyde breaks down the blood-brain barrier. And if that blood-brain barrier gets leaky, it triggers inflammation in the brain. And all disease requires inflammation. So we always want to try and keep inflammation as low as possible. So, uh, you know, we're the only mammal on the planet that drinks something other than water after we've been weaned from our mothers. Every other mammal on the planet drinks water. It's really that simple. You can infuse it with some lemon and cucumber if you like. <laughs> That's probably the best thing. Good, clean water. Tea would be a really close second. Coffee, not so bad. Uh, three pots of coffee, not so good. All right, uh, let's look at blood pressure and dementia risk. This is a, a study that was recently published of five major trials. 
And they only followed people for five years, but they did the MOCA test, which is this cognitive assessment every few months. And what they showed was uh, people with high blood pressure lost their memory quicker than those who had well-controlled blood pressure. So as a primary care doc, I want to know what's the best level. And the best level was about 140 over 80 or below to sustain memory. Diastolic, as you can see here, uh, had, was associated with the least memory loss at a diastolic of 70 to 75. Now remember, as we all get older, our arteries get a little stiff. So that's why we see systolic hypertension go up and diastolic stay the same. So we start to see that systolic hypertension as we get older, and that's mainly a process of stiffening arteries. One of the best things you can do to keep your arteries pliable are nitrates and polyphenols, berries, are really good at maintaining that flexibility of the lining of our blood vessels. So let's talk about nitrates. We had beets for dinner last night. I, some people did. There, I could just see their blood pressure lower. Any food that is grown in the ground is rich in nitrates, okay? Beets, onions, garlic. Um, I was about to say potato. Uh, I would say not potato because it's so starchy, because it has so much sugar. Yes, they have nitrates, but they also have so much sugar that I would avoid potato. But pretty much every other root vegetable I would encourage. And this is a study showing a reduction in blood pressure with beetroot juice. Always look at the sponsoring people. This was sponsored by a new company called Heartbeat. And it was spelled B-E-E-T, right? So they want to create a market for beetroot juice for lowering blood pressure. You can get this out of your garden. Works just as well. And then if you eat it with the fiber, it slows the absorption of sugar. So it reduces your risk of diabetes. Whereas just the juice increases your sugar without the fiber. And it increases the glycemic index or the speed of absorption of the sugar. So what is a low-sodium DASH diet? So a DASH diet is really a plant-forward diet, diet against systolic hypertension. Uh, it's been studied extensively. So low salt and a plant-forward diet reduced blood pressure when their blood pressure was above 150 by 20 points. That is massive. 20 points. Diastolic, 7.9 points. Now let's compare this to the best drugs we have. Probably the strongest single drug we have that we, we, we feel comfortable starting with in primary care is amlodipine or a calcium channel blocker. It causes constipation, swelling in your feet, but it works pretty good. It reduces maybe 16, 17 points. DASH, plant forward, low sodium diet, kills it in regards to therapeutic benefit. Now, what else does the nutrition do that the amlodipine doesn't do? Everything. <laughs> Everything. It reduces your risk of heart disease, cancer, dementia, you name it. All inflammatory diseases. So shouldn't we start with that? If we want the biggest return on investment for influencing our health outcomes. All right, let's talk about how a beet dilates your blood vessels. This is quite fascinating. So the nitrates in a beet, you chew it up, and it's activated by your salivary glands. That then gets swallowed and gets activated by your microbiome. Look at this ecosystem. It's just fascinating. <laughs> you eat it, chew it up, saliva, then combines with your healthy bacteria in your gut, and then that gets converted to nitrites, two oxygens versus three, and then these enzymes along the lining of your blood vessels convert that nitrite to nitric oxide. What's the most popular drug you'll see a commercial for that increases nitric oxide? Viagra. <laughs> Viagra causes an erection because it causes dilation, right? Beets, root vegetables, are your nutritional Viagra. Not a bad thing. Now, let's look at this. So once it gets converted to nitric oxide, your blood pressure goes down, your arterial stiffness goes down, the, the function of the lining of the blood vessels improves, and everybody's happy. It lowers your blood pressure, lowers your risk of cognitive decline, but there's a common medication that turns off these enzymes. 
proton pump inhibitors. Whoops, clicked the wrong button. Proton pump inhibitors. These are now over the counter. I have a vendetta against proton. <laughs> That's my implicit bias. We way overuse these drugs. They're dangerous long term, not short term. They're fine. Thank God we have them for leading ulcers. But long term, these are not good drugs. And they might inhibit our body's ability to reap the benefits of good nutrition, at least root vegetables, because it turns off the enzymes we need to convert nitrites to nitric oxide. So it blocks the potential therapeutic benefit of PPI. And who generally are on PPIs if they don't need them? Usually people have really poor nutrition because they have indigestion. So how do we serve them? <laughs> how do we help them do the right thing so we don't have to just keep giving that most vulnerable population? And remember, the most affordable foods are the worst for you generally. So how do we make that more affordable? So, um, this is a big study. There's been about three big studies now showing the longer we're on a PPI. A PPI, proton pump inhibitors like Prilosec, uh, Protonix, you know, those things that you see commercials for. Did you know we pay, as America, we pay more on the cost of antacids than we do in politics? Isn't that amazing? We pay more on antacids than we do for all of politics. And just think if we had better politics, we'd need less antacids. But. But how do we, um, whoops, sorry, I, this got away from me. So um, why? Why does our risk of a heart attack or kidney failure go up the longer we're on these drugs? We don't know. One hypothesis is we turn off lysosomes. Lysosomes live within macrophages. Macrophages, if you want any cell in your body to work optimally, you want a macrophage. It's like the chimney sweep of the lining of your blood vessels, okay? They work in part by creating an acidic environment that brings in this toxic thing, whether it's a bacteria or a toxin, and exposes it to acid and destroys it. Thank you. And then we clean out the endothelium. We don't want to shut that off. How naive are we in America to think, ah, we could just shut off something nature gave us. It'll all be okay. <laughs> it's not. We have to look at the downstream effects of this ecosystem and how we are influencing it. So, lysosome function, the longer we're on a PPI, we can, if, we, if you have interest on in learning how to get people off this drug, it's really hard because once it's suppressed, you take them off it, they get rebound hyperacidity. Even people who didn't need it in the first place feel like they have heartburn and they feel like they need it the rest of their lives. A challenge. All right, let's talk about loving and licking. <laughs> Not so much licking. Uh, well, maybe licking. <laughs> this is a rat study. Um, and they uh, uh, put rats with their moms uh, that were, they were groomed and licked and loved. And then they put rats in isolation where they didn't have their loving parent. And then they looked, unfortunately, they <laughs> had to then kill the rat. <laughs> it always seems wrong to say that. But then they looked at the dendrite formation, uh, and they showed that the loving licked rat had a significant increased growth of their dendrites. So why do I show you this? Is uh, loneliness and social isolation is one of the biggest risk factors for all causes of health. And sometimes just giving someone a compassionate hug is the most important therapy. So I want you to remember that when you go home. You don't have to lick your loved ones, but at least give them a hug. <laughs> and this study just came out a couple weeks ago, and, and, and I just wanted to stress this, uh, because it, it helps us understand why nutrition might be better to start with first before the statin, and why it might be good to, to learn mindfulness before starting the escitalopram for anxiety. This is a, a study that looked at a SSRI, a medicine that increases serotonin, and they looked at that compared to a mindfulness, eight-week mindfulness uh, program, similar to the one that you teach here. And then they wanted to see which would have a bigger effect on anxiety. And as you can see, they, they were equal. But what's the difference between meditation and a pill? Which is easier? 
the pill. <laughs> Which one affects everything, just like nutrition, in regards to long-term benefits? Meditation. I would throw Tai Chi in there, too. You know, what we're talking about here is a centering practice that gets us out of the clutter and helps us recognize what thoughts are triggering anxiety. And then just that pause into the present moment is so powerful. And when we have this pill for every ill culture, you know, maybe we should get people into mindfulness training before they see me to prescribe the drug. Maybe that's how we define these interprofessional teams. And how do we get people into the right people? And how does that, those people work together in service of the community's best outcome? And, and so these studies are starting to show that the process is often as powerful, if not more powerful, than the pill. And I think uh, these studies are going to come out more and more. So we worked with the uh, Veterans Health Administration. And oh, sorry, another prop. So uh, you've you seen these snow globes? It's the holiday season. Usually it's a good time for snow globes. There's usually something beautiful on the inside. I used to have a bigger one with a cow. I'm from Wisconsin. There's a beautiful cow, but the TSA took it from me. So, so I, I had to buy the smaller one. Uh, and there's a, a Karen in there, a, a stack of stones, something beautiful. And I can't really see it, but what do I have to do to see it? Stop. Center. <laughs> on your one thing. It might be the present moment. It might be playing the violin. It might be a prayer. It might be reciting a poem. It might be spending time with your kids. I had a faculty member who told me a story. I love this story, so I'm going to tell it to you. He was working away on his email, and his daughter, five years old, was sitting there, and I was talking to him, and, and she said, Dad, listen, listen to me. And he said, I am listening, honey. And she said, no, listen to me with your eyes. Wow. <laughs> you know, giving people ourselves the, the attention it needs is our greatest gift. And, and we don't always give it to time. So how we do this for each other, and we're trying to do this uh, at our clinics, and we did this at the VA health system. And uh, uh, so what is going to motivate those behaviors? And I think asking different questions is the key. Is why do you want to be healthy? Your why. Why do you want to eat better? Why do you want to forgive your neighbor? Why do you want to get up and exercise? Why do you want to move or learn new things? Why? Usually we won't do it for ourselves, but we'll do it for someone we love. So what is that? What's your why? And we did this with the largest healthcare system in the country, the VA health system. And uh, we really wanted to start the domino effect. And if we're going to manage diabetes, and all I do is focus on hemoglobin A1C, and that becomes the root of our conversation, and I say, hey, you know, your A1C isn't as low as we'd like. You need to lose more weight and exercise and eat better. How does that make you feel? <laughs> Broke. Like, I didn't do my homework, right? That makes everybody feel bad. But if we ask, why do you want to keep your diabetes under control? How do you connect that to love and meaning and purpose and your why? That is more effective at influencing people to want to take care of themselves. And, and that's why what matters starts the domino effect towards better outcomes. So we have to invest in that. That requires deeper, longer conversations. So this is the mandala we used in the VA. The whys in the middle, we taught mindfulness to the VA. And we encourage them to sit in presence with another human being and really go a little bit deeper towards meaning. That was the first step. Then we would ask the human that we were serving, you know your body better than anyone. Where do you feel you need to start? They would say, huh, I can't sleep at night. I got a little PTSD. I've got these bad dreams. All right, our mental health, our mindfulness teacher, our psychologist, those are the people that we need to create our interprofessional team around. We need to create our team around that person's need. And how do we recruit those people is the who. So we define the health team based on the health needs of the context of that person's life. And then that, you start with the, the hurt person, ask their why, 
They tell you where they need to start. You recruit the professional that creates a health community towards whole health. Did that matter? Well, this is not a VA study, but it is a study that showed that people who had more meaning, more why, more purpose in their life were two and a half times less likely to die early after age 50 if they had something to get up for. Jack, I would argue, probably had something to get up for every morning. That curiosity, that twinkle. What is that that keeps us moving? This is the pharmaceutical costs. Uh, some of the VA clinics did this whole health model, some didn't. In the blue, you can see the pharmaceutical costs for those where we started to address what matters to them. Generally, if we go there, we need less drugs. We need less things. That's value-based care. That's understanding how we create a process to reduce the need for things. It's a different strategy. There's great resources online. We give this out to our patients on their annual physicals. It's a two-page self-assessment. They tell us what they want their health for. They tell us where we need to start together. So much time is saved <laughs> having them do this at home and then bringing it in so we can go deep right away. I encourage you to use it. You paid for these resources, <laughs> your tax dollar. We put uh, the patient's health goals at the top of our, our electronic health record. So now, what everybody sees, now, are, are you all going into your electronic health record? Have you done that? You can, at least for Epic, and you can see your problem list. Your problem list. You can see what's wrong with you. It just makes you feel terrible. <laughs> I got depression, heart disease, hypertension, hemorrhoids, oh my god, <laughs> you know? Is that what we want to be messaging the people we care about? We made it so your goal floats to the top of your problem list. So now my patients see what's important to them. Now the emergency room nurse sees what's important to them. Now the oncologist sees what's important to them. Now we message meaning in the person we're serving to help them find their best outcome instead of just projecting our science. Evidence, you need my evidence, right? Not a bad thing, but the timing is really important of when you need my evidence. We realized that we, first of all, wanted to create our clinics as salutogenic centers, but we realized people come to us because they're suffering. That's not gonna change. So we're now partnering with community centers in our community, so we have a partnership. We have that for at-risk kids. We have a learning kitchen. Uh, in one of our hospitals, we have, uh, we're developing a, in partnership, uh, Alex G is our local leader who's creating a black center of excellence because we are having this brain drain of our African American communities. And what they tell us is they need a place of belonging. How we create a sense of belonging for every human being, you know, that's a strategy where they then have a social support network that gives them permission and confidence to do some of these things despite adverse childhood experiences, or whatever is in the context of someone's life. All right, so let's put it all together. And um, this is kind of the crib notes, if you will. First one, enjoy foods from roots and fins. You can enjoy other foods too, but mainly roots and fins. I think that's what the evidence is, is telling us. Number two, avoid consuming humans and manipulation of nature's nutrition. <laughs> I wish I had good examples of how we've manipulated food and it had a good outcome, but so far, I'm a little skeptical. Um, so the best way to get around that, and I'm paraphrasing Michael Pollan, eat multicolored whole foods that were recently alive with people you love. We did that last night, I think. <laughs> eat multicolored whole foods that were recently alive. That's important. You need processing if they're not recently alive with people you love. All right, the next, keep blood pressure below 140 over 80. Avoid unnecessary pharmaceuticals and supplements. Now let me preface this. Thank God for pharmaceuticals and nutritional supplements. But if we're really facilitating a salutogenic science, we want the fewest, most effective ones possible. How do we get all of our, new, our supplements from plants? And, and, and that's a great example of synergy that if I have a Let's take cruciferous vegetables, one of the most powerful 
foods, they have four leaves that cross, cru uh, crucifix, cross, cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, kale, cabbage, um, cauliflower. They all have four leaves that cross. Uh, we think one of the active ingredients is indole-3-carbinol, so you can take that as a supplement. But we're learning that if I take that versus eating the whole plant, the whole plant has synergy that is much greater effect than its parts. So it's always better to eat the food than to take the supplement, unless you're malnourished. Most, uh, I hope most folks are not malnourished, but some are. And uh, if we can't get them good food, college students is who I'm thinking about, uh, generally. <laughs> uh, keep your body and brain moving. Tie loose knots. <laughs> I think uh, uh, Jack and, and many of you and, and a lot of the movement therapies that you do, uh, that does everything, right? It not only clears the clutter, moves the body, moves the mind, maintains our balance, improves lymph and blood flow. So important. And then uh, adopt a practice that regularly clears your mind's clutter. Uh, what is that for you? Maybe it's just giving your child attention, <laughs> listening to them with your eyes. You know, they're your one thing. That's all it is. That's meditation. Medi uh, comes from the root word, uh, a thoughtful act to create order. Meditation, medicine. Isn't that a beautiful def definition of medicine? But what has our culture done to it? Now it's a pill. No, medicine is a thoughtful act to create order. What a beautiful thing. All right. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. It's frozen on me. I need your help, guys. Um, while you're fixing that, uh, or maybe you could just advance to the next slide. Here, let me try to escape. Oh, it froze up completely. All right. Let's see. Let's talk about putting this all together. Let's talk about how we perceive things. And I want to end with uh, some quantum mechanics. Okay? I love quantum mechanics because I can't figure it out. <laughs> but there's really smart physicists who say, this makes sense. And in quantum mechanics, one of the, one of the solid statements is everything in nature is both a wave and a particle. A wave. 10 billion potential waveforms, and then particles. How do we collapse that potential into a physical thing? A physical thing. We're realizing that our perception, our willingness to see it in a new way, helps collapse that potential into a real thing. Thank you, Darsha. I <laughs> appreciate that. <laughs> So how we see it makes it matter. So if we're going to switch from, switch from a pathogenic science, not throw that out, maintain it, but create a better balance with salutogenic science, we have to look at humans differently. We have to see what's right with them instead of just what's wrong with them. We have to same person and say, hey, let's explore the pattern that gets you to your goals, to how you want to be as a human being. That's a different science. And, um, and so the potential is collapsed into a particle by our conscious perception. An example, if you're a parent, is, oh, sorry. Everybody have one of these? I have, uh, oh, sorry. It changed. Apple changed it to the planet. Maybe that's a good thing, but I used to have a picture of my kids, right? And my wife. And, uh, uh, and the cell tower, don't tell my family, uh, the cell tower collapses all that potential energy into one thing. How we look upon it matters. So if you're raising a child, you don't want to raise your child with this perception. You want to matter amount to anything, because you're actually determining their destiny. You're taking that potential, and you're collapsing it into less potential. <laughs> so how do we do this in healthcare? How do we take these billions of possibilities 
in, in healthcare, we, we, we call this a state of liminality. A state of liminality is when I come through that clinic exam room door, there's someone there, we enter into this place of suspension where I hear your story, you hear my story, we find a path to then fall into a better outcome. That's the state of liminality. That's perceiving the potential of human healing instead of just trying to fix things once they're broke. Both are good. <laughs> We're just out of balance. We just need to, to bring that into balance. I'm going to end with these two uh, <laughs> stories <laughs> to stress the importance of humility, right? Sure, if you do all these things, you might live longer. I hope you do. And you will add life to your years, which I hope we do. But it may not. <laughs> and there's so much we don't know. This is a story of a gentleman. Uh, he was called the world's dirtiest man. He went through a childhood trauma and uh, was um, believed that if he ever bathed, it would cause him harm. So he went all these years, 94 years, where he would... Uh, he lived outside, never bathed. He would smoke manure. And he lived to be 94. And then the town people finally convinced him to bathe. And then he died. <laughs> I don't know if that's what killed him. But it's important to listen to humans, right? They'll usually tell you what's wrong and how to treat it. And uh, he seems like he was doing OK, even smoking manure <laughs> for 94 years. Another example of this is, is uh, Jean Clement, the oldest documented living human being, she lived to be 122, and uh, she smoked. She didn't eat real well, <laughs> but she lived to be 122, and she said, always keep your smile, that is how I explain my long life. And she had a great sense of humor, and at, at 121, she was quoted as saying, I have only one wrinkle and I'm sitting on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's, I, I want to be like her, right? So, so pray for a good harvest, but keep on hoeing. That's the, that's the, so that's all I have for you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so grateful. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have time for Q&A. Yeah, <laughs> well, thank you. That was... I was expecting something incredible. That was super incredible. Um, and just speaks to the amazing work you do and the vision you bring, and, but also just, I think, resonates in the spirit of, of this, the spirit of this particular lecture and, and Jack's life and Mary's vision along with that. And, and I think our overall Osher Center, a lot of what you say you heard in, in our clinicians last night. I mean, we, we share this, this shared vision. And I think the challenge is, how do we do this? And how do we do it on a large scale? So thank you for setting that map and, and all the training that you do in Wisconsin and, and, and internationally. So um, we're really grateful to have you here to, to share that. Um.